Hi, everyone. This is Raghu Marcus with another edition of Ramdas Here and Now. This talk today is from 1996, not long before he had that stroke that everybody knows about. The movie was made about it called Fierce Grace. By the way, if you haven't seen that, that's a fantastic movie by Mickey Lemley. And before I get into uh, introducing the talk today, I just want to uh, first thank everybody for the support that you're, you have been giving to the foundation, Love, Serve, Remember Foundation, under which Ramdas.org and everything that we do, including the retreats in Maui, uh, takes place. And to continue, please do continue the support in the holiday season. This is a time when we do ask for people uh, directly. Uh, we have our fund drive. That's uh, when you get this, it'll be going on. I imagine you'll have received either a letter or an email from us asking to help support what we've been doing so that we can continue to do it, to con- the continuation, the preservation of of whatever everything that Ramdas has done over the years that we have in that vast media library and uh, everything we're doing going forward. We have some tremendous projects going on, a, a wonderful movie that we're working on um, with uh, Ramdas for next year. So please do go ahead. And uh, one of the things you can do that's a win-win for everybody, as they say, is go to ramdas.org and go to the store. And you, there's all sorts of wonderful items that you can purchase that uh, are great gifts. And at the same time, of course, it goes a long way to helping support what we're doing. That's one way, aside from donations. And um, there's downloads and books and DVDs and all sorts of uh, and malas. And we even have a Be Here Now clock, which we had before. And it's just come back again. We have uh, found a better manufacturer for it. So please go to ramdas.org and in any way you can help uh, support what we're doing so that we can continue all of the offerings that we present on ramdas.org. Not to forget also Love Everyone, that wonderful book that we're putting out that we just released last week uh, through Harper One, written by Parvati Marcus. That is available. Uh, so there you go. Enough said. So this this talk by Ramdas is really a lot around dealing with thoughts and attachment to thoughts and attachment to who we think we are. Uh, he talks about how we we've been socialized out of any recognition of who we truly are. And then uh, and this is something many of us can recognize through he talked about how through mushrooms and when he was introduced by Leary to mushrooms he said, I recognized I'd been had. <laughs> and can we all not relate with that? Suddenly you see this new universe opening up, this new reality, which shows you you are not your body, you are not your senses, you are not your mind. And there is another, uh, as uh, Castaneda put it, a separate reality. And, of course, we deal with every day, every day. Everyone wants to believe they are who they think they are, and we want to believe it as well. Uh, So there is a process of cultivating another part of our minds, and Ram Dass talks about mindfulness here. Way before it was a catchword, this is 1996, remember? So it's the way in which you can stand aside from your life, from your incarnation, and witness it. But at the same time, it's not like you don't involve yourself in your day-to-day life. It's not a matter of detachment. It's a matter of a new vantage point from which you can see everything, and yet at the same time, your involvement in life is, uh, is going on. It's a simultaneous adventure, shall we say. And I, uh, w- whenever I talk to people, I say, you know, one of the main things that has happened for me over these many years of, of, of course, since the time when I first met Maharaji and all of the different kinds of practices that I've engaged with, 
I think that the, the, the most outstanding thing I can say is that I have stopped paying as much attention to my thoughts as I used to. I have stopped uh, being so concerned about my neurotic behavior. Uh, I'm not chasing my tail, certainly as much as I used to. So Ram Dass talks uh, quite a bit about that in this. In this. Um, he talks about, see the relative nature of what you thought was real. That's, that happens when you use mindfulness and the witness in particular. Where your mind is in relation to the game is what either creates suffering or relieves suffering, yours and everyone else's. Right? Good one. And uh, at some point in this talk, uh, he gives a little practice, uh, and the practice of taking three breaths. And I, uh, I'm all I want to do is point out this is a good practice to pick up when you listen to this talk, uh, you listen to that more than once, I think it would be great to actually even write down what that practice is and be able to... That's something that one can do on a day-to-day basis at any point uh, in your day to help uh, bring you back into what's called a luminous ground, into that more of that place of who we really are. And he has a couple of great quotes here, from uh, one from a Zen master, our true nature is beyond all categories. That's just a piece of that quote. And something from the Tao, when you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant. I love that. I love that. And then there's another little thing, which is another little practice, uh, aside from the breaths. I hadn't heard this before. I mean, I've heard Ram Dass do this, but not uh, in, in one of these talks from back then. It's him singing Jay Bhagavan, Hail to God, basically. Uh, but just a beautiful melody, and, uh, and he sang it so sweetly, so it's another highlight. And then it, this ends about, uh, with him talking about this all is the edge of the mystery, and that's what I'm going to call this, the edge of the mystery. Isn't it for all of us, the edge of the mystery? So here we go. This is Ramdas here and now, the edge of the mystery. See, it's like you're sitting on the edge of a river. And the river's just, or a stream, and it's floating right by you. And you're just sitting there. And down the stream are going little insects that are landed on the water, leaves, pieces of dust, and you're sitting there watching all this go by. And each one as it's going by is like a thought or a feeling or a sensation that says, think me or feel me. So I say, I'm hot. Well, are you all hot? You know, like I went to a woman, she said, I'm dying. I said, well, she said, I'm so bored. I said, well, do you have to die 60 minutes an hour? Couldn't you say die 10 minutes an hour and be somebody else the other 50 minutes? Must be a drag to be dying all the time. How uninteresting. You could do better than that. We're a little like that frog experiment, you know, where they put the frogs in, and if they warm the water slowly enough, the frogs boil to death. While if you put them in boiling water, they jump out. And we got socialized out of any recognition of who we were, other than who we were trained to think we were. So now we are, our egos are a product of a web of relationships that we, I don't know what you call it, it's culture, it's meta-culture, including genetics. For me, it wasn't until I, until I was 30 years old when, I, uh, when Tim Leary gave me uh, this Tiananoctal, the flesh of the gods mushroom, that I recognized I'd been had. <laughs> that in effect, I had bought into the whole game and I thought I was who I thought I was. And I suddenly realized that was nonsense. And that's the kind of heresy that gets you drummed right out of the culture if you're not careful because everybody else wants to believe they are who they think they are. And they don't want any 
reflection back to them that that may be suspect. Joseph Joubert said, how many people eat, drink, get married, buy and sell, build, make contracts and attend to their fortunes, have friends and enemies, pleasures and pains, are born, grow up, live and die, and do the whole thing asleep. Do the whole thing thinking you are that person. I mean, you and I so short shrift ourselves, it's unbelievable to me how caught we get. And I am caught just like you're caught. But the difference for me, not from you, but the differences are in the realm of knowing you're caught. As Gurdjieff said, you are in prison. If you would escape from prison, the first thing you must recognize and acknowledge is that you are in prison. If you think you're free, no escape is possible. But I think the statement of, um, of our predicament as we sit by the river is the statement, uh, don't just do something, sit there. That's the biggest antidote for our addiction. Don't just do something, sit there. Don't just do something, sit there. If you look at your life, you will be amazed how much you got trapped in the concept that more is better. Whether it's more food, whether it's more education, whether it's more travel, whether it's more money, whether it's more cars, whether it's more... I remember speaking at a um, fancy hotel in New Hampshire many years ago. And um, it was filled with very wealthy people. And uh, the, it had been raining for six weeks. Why they invited me, I have no idea. Okay. Somebody called Ramdas. It was a Jewish fancy hotel. And so it's because my father used to raise charities speaking there. That's why. So the manager takes me down to his office, which has pictures of Rudy Valley and all those players that have played there. And he says, now, he says, um, it's the first good day. We want to get people out on the golf courses and to the lake. So after lunch, they're having a heavy brisket lunch. So they can't act fast. So we'll give them a little rest. And you speak then for about 20 minutes. <laughs> what they're giving me in return is my lunch, the brisket. So lunch is over. I go out and sitting out on deck chairs are my audience. The men are in bathing suits. They show the brisket and they have huge cigars. Long, long cigars. The women have um, hair very coiffured and very blue and eyes and all the whole thing. And they're in a style that was a fad at that time, sort of see-through bathing suits. You know, plasticky see-through but not quite. So there they were. And I said to them, well, you've really made it, haven't you? <laughs> you know, I couldn't resist. And I don't know why that is. That's a lack of compassion, because what I said is, you really made it, didn't you? And they all smiled. I said, the parking lot is full of Cadillacs with a few Rolls's. Your kids are there's money for their education. You probably have winter homes and summer homes. You have furs. You have all the things you could want. You have insurance. You have health care. You have good doctors on call. The whole thing. I said, you've really made it. And they're all there. And I said, is it enough? And there was this kind of and I just left it sitting there. Is it enough? All I'll tell you is that two hours later, 
despite repeated calls from the, the hotel staff saying, golf is beginning in, down at the boathouse, Will. Nobody went. I figured, for lunch, I'll give them everything I've got to offer. And when I went across the lawn to go to my car, they were following me across the lawn. It was like a Pied Piper Hieronymus Bosch painting of some extraordinary, yeah. It's, it's who we all are. I mean, I'm them and I'm me. Where The humor is inclusive. It's, it's not talking about other people that I wouldn't say to their face. That's my criterion, I guess. Not that I haven't said to their face, but that I wouldn't. Thich Nhat Hanh says, just take three breaths. So these breaths are going to be long, slow breaths. That's all we're going to do. And then we'll work from that plane of consciousness. So just take three breaths and first in breath and the out breath and if you like visualizing you can visualize like you're breathing out everything that would be an impediment to you knowing a deeper part of yourself. And then on the second breath, from your heart, just express something healing for all beings. I'm going to do this with you, so. And on the third breath, just let yourself go with your breath out into the universe. Okay, three slow breaths. Breathing out any impediments to you knowing your own true being. Second breath in. On the out breath, from your heart, touch each being everywhere with peace, with happiness, with freedom. On the third breath, I know you breathed in between, it's fine. Don't, don't get compulsive, don't get compulsive. See, I don't... There are a lot of little streets we didn't take it. We were waiting for the big, big turn off. And on the third breath, just allow yourself to go out with the breath and start to feel your being part of the sounds, the things you feel, then imagine out into the universe, and then keep letting go of your imagination and just keep going into that place. Now you can take the third breath. There's a story of a monk who was approached by a samurai. And the monk was very, very short, and the samurai was huge. And the samurai was very arrogant, and he said, Monk, teach me about heaven and hell. Stood belligerently in front of the monk. And the monk looked up at this huge being and said, teach you? You've got a rusty blade, your clothes smell, you think you're a warrior, teach you? Disgust me. And the sun, nobody talks to a samurai like that. And the samurai was so ferociously upset, his neck was all red with blood, he pulled out his sword and went to cut off the head of the monk. And just as he was about to do it, the monk said, 
that's hell. And the samurai, with sword in mid-level, realized that this man had just practically offered his life to teach him the thing he had asked to have taught. And he was so profoundly grateful, he bowed to the monk, and the monk said, and that's heaven. And it's extraordinary how reactive we are. How reactive we are and how much we live in the hells created by our reactivity. Not by the things themselves. Not by the things themselves, but how your mind works with it. Now the process of cultivating another part of your mind, which could be called there are a lot of labels for it. Witness, mindfulness, um, soul. It's where you're still a separate entity, but you're standing aside from life. But you're not standing aside in the sense of denial. You're not denying life. Then it would be a dissociative experience. You're just standing aside from life. So your witness and your involvement in life are both going on simultaneously. I would say if there were one instruction I would give you is learn to live your life on more than one plane of consciousness simultaneously. That's the most wise thing I could say to you at this point. Because the minute you do that, you see the relative nature of what you thought was real. And you see it's only relatively real, including your death and your suffering and your whole shtick. My whole shtick as well, I'm not... I would say that, uh, by the way, once you realize that there is this other part of your mind that is reflective, that is quiet, that is spacious, that is silent, that is empty, that is present in everything, that isn't judging, it's just uh, acknowledging. It's not condoning or not condoning, it's just acknowledging. What is? Once you know that's a part of your mind, once you can remember, since all of us are going in and out of that all the time, but most of the time we don't attend to that as something, we just see it as a flickering of our attention to the thing we thought we were looking at. Or we say we're very self-conscious. Like here I am talking to you and we're talking about something, now a thought comes in, I'm talking to them. Do they like me? It's a good one, huh? Do I like them? <laughs> Are we truly a family? Etc. And then the thought leaves and I go back into the moment, but then there's this thing. Now you can call that self-consciousness as a, like a flaw and see it as intruding on your ability to stay in the situation. Like going to a concert and then thinking about the fact that the violinist has a cold. That's what happened to me. I was with Isaac Stern one night, and he had a bad cold, and he had to play a concert I was going to sit through. And all evening, he was playing absolutely beautiful <laughs> Mozart, and I was just busy thinking, he's, he's thinking about his cold. <laughs> Once you understand that there is the possibility that there are parts of your mind that your cultural situation and your acculturation and all of it doesn't support as real. Once you are that much of a heretic to realize there is a larger context in which this whole game is going on. Then you are, in other words, the curriculum has been set. Now you can go do whatever you damn please. Because once you know that and you understand that the end of your experience of suffering, not the end of it, but the balancing of your experience of suffering as an ego, will be offset by your soul's appreciation of the context and the way in which suffering is grace. It's interesting. You can see who is awakened and who isn't. Somebody that isn't awakened says, only says suffering stinks. Someone who's begun to awaken says, suffering is grace. 
And someone who's free says, suffering is grace and it stinks. <laughs> See, that's the whole descent, ascent, descent, the integration of it all. There's nowhere you can't stand. You've got to be an impeccable game player these next days. Don't be a slob. Your impeccability will be a function of how much you're not trapped in your game. So if you were playing Monopoly, don't become the iron of the top hat. You know, neither a seller nor a buyer be. And then sell the hell out of it. I'm not ever saying, please don't think, I'm saying in any way that one game is better than another. I'm saying where your mind is in relation to the game is what either creates suffering or relieves suffering. Yours and everybody else's, by the way. I mean, I go into rooms with people who are dying in the most extreme conditions, with AIDS, with cancer, with ALS, etc. And my job when I go in there, my healing job, it's like Stephen Levine's book, Healing into Life and Death. My job is to be an environment of presence of consciousness that allows that person to do what they need to do to die. My job is to have a model of how they should die, but to create an environment where they will do what they need to do. And if by chance they come up for air, I'll be out in the stoop with my ball ready to play against the steps. Hi, come on out and play. No, my mother said I couldn't. Okay. Just sort of sitting there. Then somebody puts their head out. Because under those moments of trauma and when there's... The beauty of working with dying people is there's no bullshit. It's really an opportunity for moments of truth with one human being to another. Because the other person figures they got nothing to lose. And you figure this is the best game in town for me to get conscious. My job is to walk in and not close my heart. I've got to walk in with my heart wide open, my human emotional heart, so that when I see, like I did a couple of days ago, this fellow with ALS who just can use dots and dashes now. He purses his lips for dots and raises his eyebrows for dashes. And Morse code is the way we communicate. And he's got no other movement. And my first experience is incredible claustrophobia like the entire country must have had when Christopher Reeves uh, had his accident. And I sit with that. I don't get lost in the drama of that, but I don't deny it. I feel it. I feel, in other words, I empathize with his predicament. But empathy is still a relational concept. It's still treating the other person as separate from yourself. And there's another gift yet to be given where your awareness is so spacious it includes them. There's only the awareness. And you meet behind the, behind the, behind the, behind the, are you there? I'm here. Behind where you're looking at yourself, looking at yourself, looking at yourself. And then after all the trip of doing something, you're just being, you're sitting. Just there. Zen Master Yasutani, our true nature is beyond all categories. Whatever you can conceive or imagine, whatever you can conceive or imagine, is but a fragment of yourself. Hence the real you cannot be found through logical deduction or intellectual analysis or endless imagining. Doesn't leave you much space, does it? To hide in, to be somebody doing something. Because the final gift you give to another person is to offer them an awareness where you are resting in the same space they are. And there's just the I, the I of God, the I, the I, E Y E, and the I. And the eye is just, it's interesting. One of the most advanced meditation techniques I'm using now is called Dzogchen in Tibetan Buddhism. I use lots. I'm a schlock, dilettante, uh, uh, 
I dig many shallow wells and get nowhere. Um, this is Oak Gen practice. One of the things you do is you lie down on your back with some sky, which you can find at certain wind conditions here. <laughs> you look at the sky, and once you see the sky, you feel the vast expanse of it. You feel the timeless nature of it. You feel the presence of it. And then through the sky fly birds, fly planes, go clouds, whatever, hand gliders, helicopters. And each of these becomes like a phenomenon that is arising, exists, and then it dissolves. And you keep looking at the sky. And then you do this interesting thing. You see that whole scene, once you've got it going, of listening to the airplane come, be, and then go, and watching all these things come and go. You see the sky as a mirror of your consciousness. And you become the sky. That's the whole experiment. That's the whole practice. You can do it. It's one of the most advanced. It was secret until about 10, 15 years ago. Because people needed such preparation to do it. Now, for some reason, they've opened it to the hordes, like us. So I'm sharing it. I'm sure I'm not supposed to. <laughs> uh, it's enough, you know, just to say, is more better or is enough enough? When you can say enough is enough, you will start to treasure things like voluntary simplicity, You'll start to treasure things like moments of quietness to savor the whole thing. Because part of the witness is doing is savoring it, is looking at the incredible beauty of the incarnation, of the whole manifestation of God. And the wonderful thing is your stance as, as that witness or that soul is not like I'm tr as looking at your incarnation and experiencing your incarnation, your work of your soul is not... The work of the soul is twofold. One is to live out the incarnation to work out its karma. And the other part of the soul is, all of you that have read Rumi or Kabir know, the yearning of the separate entity to return to the, to the formless, to the non-separate, to beyond the concept of one. And that is what the soul's game is, is the tension between that yearning to go back to be a Xin one, with the recognition that when you dissolve back into it all, there it all still is, including you. Except you're not busy being you anymore. You're just another one of them. To tell you the truth, I have no idea who I am and I don't even care. You know? And everything you think I am is your projection. It's your problem, not mine. Unless I buy it, then it's mine. So you go, oh, wonderful, thank you. Thanks, right. That's like typhoid Mary comes up to me and wants to kiss me, you know. Yes, I am, really. I'm pretty wise. You know. You can watch yourself buy in, and then you watch why you're buying in. What did you need that you had to buy in? Because every time you buy into any conceptual model of who you are, you've just gone back into prison. There is no definition for who you are. Don't even try. And the closest you can do is keep asking, who am I? Who am I? And realize that that I is really awareness that is funneled through into somebodyness, and then comes out, I think I think that. So value quietness. Value simplicity. It's tough in a society with a whole materialistic orientation, not materials like things, but like, like form. The whole materialistic thing is based on more is better. It's really hard to get out of that model that more experiences are better. At least experiences you want to save, don't you? I haven't yet been to Yellowstone Park. You've already had a thousand experiences and you don't even experience this moment. 
And once you experience this moment, any moment as this moment, you're fully in it, you're fully listening, you're fully mindfully open to it, all your neurosis and all the sounds and all your models in your head and all, it's just swirling around or going down the river or, or whatever you want to say, whatever metaphor you want of it. And you're experiencing quietness. You're experiencing quietness. This is a quote from the Tao Te Ching, a beautiful Chinese wisdom book. When you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant, disinterested, amused, kind-hearted as a grandmother, dignified as a king, immersed in the wonders of the way, like, wow, look at that. You can deal with whatever life brings you, and when death comes, you're ready. I know I'm overloading circuits terribly, but, but no, I'm not, you know, and I am, unquote, overloading mine, you know. See, I keep wanting to give up linearity all the time. Because you get an idea, and then we all hear the idea, and why keep making all the transitions into the next idea? I just soon go on, but it's a speaking convention. This is a quotation from Ananda Mahima. She is uh, one of the great, great saints uh, of Indian history and of, to me, the universe. And she died in 1983, and she had millions of millions of people who were devoted to her. And I was certainly one of them. I wasn't a, a disciple, but I certainly loved her. And she radiated a quality of being that was so powerful, whether you saw it visually or you heard her sing, that like 15, 30, 40, 50,000 people would sit there absolutely in trance just to be with her. There was nothing she wanted from anybody. She wasn't hustling. You didn't sign up anywhere. There was no money past hands. And um, often she would just, she was a, a great bhakti, a great devotee. Her heart was so, you could feel the depth of her compassion. And she would sing to God. She would be the soul singing to the, the beloved. And the word for beloved is Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jaya Bhagavan. Jai Bhagavan, Jai Bhagavan. She would just sing that, and we would all be here together in that space. And these are, at one moment, um, Paramanansa Yogananda, who I'm sure many of you have read, Autobiography of Yogi. He asked Ananda Mai Ma to tell him something of her life. Father, she said, there is little to tell. My consciousness has never associated itself with this temporary body. Before I came on this earth, Father, I was the same. I grew into womanhood, but still, I was the same. When the family in which I had been born made arrangements to have this body married, I was the same. And Father, in front of you now, I am the same. Even afterwards, though the dance of creation changes around me in the hall of eternity, I shall be the same. All I'm asking of you is that you acknowledge this other part of your consciousness and respect it enough to cultivate a doorway into it, to give balance to the rest of your life so that you can truly play and play in the marketplace and play in a way 
which heals you and everybody around you. I'll tell you, the whole game to me is an incredible mystery about suffering, about death, and I feel like I am sitting at the edge of a mystery, not that I need to know, I am just becoming the answer to the mystery, and I love a mystery. Thank you. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.